Welcome to Until Ministries. We're so kind of you to join us today. Well, I'm really excited. We're going to start today a, a three-program series on a very important concept that I think will help all of us through our difficult life circumstances. And it's, um, it's all about perspective. In the next three weeks, we'll be looking at it. And um, our perspective, it really determines our response to our life circumstances, doesn't it? So perspective is very important because it determines how I'm going to respond to life circumstances. And how I respond can have significant impact on the outcome. So we're going to look at a concept called ALIVE, A-L-I-V-E. And ALIVE stands for Always Living in View of Eternity. It's an eternal perspective, always living in view of eternity. And we're going to find out as Christians that as we live in view of eternity, which is produced by the Holy Spirit, we will be able to manage hard times. Peter tells us in his first epistle that the end of all things is at hand. And uh, that means that Christ is coming soon. And we need to be prepared for that. Um, it's imminent. And so with this in view, how should we respond? So what we're going to do is today, we're going to look at uh, how we should respond. And then the next two weeks, I hope you'll join us the next two weeks as well. The next two weeks, we're going to look at some very, very practical uh, advantages and practical improvements that will come into our lives when we have that eternal perspective. And so I think it'll be very, very beneficial and very practical to all of us. So let's look at um, how we should respond. So we respond to life's circumstances by praying earnestly. Respond to life's circumstances by praying earnestly. And we see that in 1 Peter 4, 7. He's talking about prayer. And he says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. In other words, we need the right perspective so that we can pray powerfully, so that we can pray in close communion with God, close relationship with God. And so we need to respond to life circumstances by praying earnestly with the proper perspective. And that proper perspective is what we're talking about in this series. And that is that we always have a perspective of eternity. We're always living in view of eternity. We're broadening our picture from, from our little world and our little time and our little life, which is uh, just a quick vapor, the Bible says, to the big picture, to the eternal picture. And the reason Peter says that the end is all at hand, because even then they were expecting the Lord's coming. And you say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. But remember, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years with the Lord. He isn't bound by time. So he's not slow, Peter tells us, uh, concerning his promise. We always should look at Christ's coming as imminent. But not only that, we don't know when we're going to draw our last breath, do we? Uh, we're all mortal. We could die at any time. And so we need to be aware of eternity. We need to be aware that we can enter at any time, either through death or through the rapture, through Christ coming for us. When he comes, it will be in an instant. We'll be taken to be with him and our earthly lives will be over. So we need to face our daily living with a sense of eternal values. Always live in view of eternity. We need to remember that our mind can get out of balance by temporal, earthly lusts and pursuits and desires and things that we get involved in. And that distracts us so that we don't know the fellowship and the communion of God to the depth that we should. And our prayer life is compromised because our Mind is fixed on earthly things, not on eternal things. Remember, we need to always live in view of eternity. 
And so when we have a mind that is fixed on Christ's return, when we have a mind that is fixed on eternity, then our mind is purified and we can enjoy the fullness of fellowship with the Lord and we can enjoy the full communion of the Lord in a powerful prayer life. But without, without that viewpoint, without that perspective of eternity, our mind's going to be out of balance by things that happen in this world. So we have to respond by praying earnestly with the proper perspective, as I've just said, but also with the proper posture. Peter goes on to say that we should be of sound judgment. We should be of a serious spirit. We should be clear-minded. We should be self-controlled. We should stay wide awake. We should be disciplined in our prayers and make a proper estimate of all things in the sight of God. Prayer is so important. It's not an activity. It should be a way of life. And so we have to pray with that proper perspective. We have to pray with that proper posture where we're, we're of sound judgment and serious spirit and self-controlled. A good prayer life takes self-control, doesn't it? It takes discipline. And so we need to keep that in mind. And also we need to respond to life circumstances by praying with the proper practice. And that means giving ourselves, being devoted, the Bible says, to prayer on a continual basis as a way of life. So many people compartmentalize and say, well, I'm going to have my prayer time in the morning or I'm going to have my prayer time as I fall asleep at night. And that's fine, but we should always be in the mode of prayer. It should be an ongoing way of life, not an isolated activity. We should be in constant communication with the Lord, always, always, always. And so prayer is uh, being devoted to prayer and giving ourselves over to prayer is very important as we prepare for life circumstances. So uh, in, in this talk about prayer, it's, it's in the plural imperative structure. So it means praying with and for each other. We should be praying with and for each other. <clears throat> if you are uh, a married couple, you should be praying for each other, but you should be praying with each other and so on. If you have a, a, a Bible friend, uh, a fellowship friend, uh, someone that is sort of an accountability partner, you need to pray together and pray for each other and with each other. So as we face life, life circumstances, if we want to have that alive perspective, we have to pray earnestly. Secondly, we have to respond to life circumstances by loving one another deeply. And let's read 1 Peter, continue in chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. So we are to love each other very deeply. And then it says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And so what we're looking at here is if we want to respond in a way that has eternity in mind, then we have to love one another deeply. Uh, that we need to respond to life circumstances by loving one another deeply. And that will happen as we develop this alive, always living in view of eternity perspective. So the definition here of love, the Greek word that's used here, many of you know, is agape, which is a sacrificial love in action. It's selflessly seeking the betterment of the one who is loved and disregarding the cost to self. Um, and this is, of course, the love that Jesus demonstrated on Calvary. And this is very, very important. So we need to respond to our life circumstances by loving one another deeply. And it's a priority. It's that sacrificial love. We don't count the cost to ourselves, but we're looking for the betterment of the one who's loved. And it's got to be above all. It's got to be our top priority as Christians. 
It's most important distinguishing it's the most important distinguishing trait of true christianity remember jesus said in uh, john 13 35 he said uh he said that they will know you are christians by your what by your love your love is that distinguishing factor so that's why it's so important and then the love also has to be intense it has to be fervent in love for others stretching and reaching out to the limit, uh, really, really giving and really sacrificing and pushing to, to show the love in action. Remember, agape love is love in action, giving until it hurts, if you will. And we need to, um, we need to keep on loving. We need to, um, it's got to be continual. It's got to be something that we exercise all the time as we yield to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to monitor our love to make sure that we're living in a loving fashion. Now, when it says, let's look at its outworking, the love's outworking a little bit. When it says that it covers a multitude of sins, uh, that means that true agape love um, is always forgiving again and again and again. Remember the emphasis that Jesus put on, uh, on, on love uh, and on forgiveness. Remember Jesus taught that we need to forgive one another. And the disciples said, well, how many times? I mean, <laughs> you expect us to forgive like seven times? And remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, no, not seven times, 70 times seven. Did he mean 490? No, he meant ad infinitum. We are to forgive again and again and again. And all of us know that sometimes we forgive someone and they turn around and they do the exact same thing again. Uh, and the Bible says to forgive them again. And so part of loving the way we should love is forgiving others. And if we're going to, if we're always living in view of eternity, this all makes sense, doesn't it? Because why hold on to some grudge? Uh, you know, if you have the view of eternity and you're going to, if you know Christ is your Savior, if there's been a time in your life when you've asked him to forgive your sin, a time in your life when you said, dear Lord Jesus, I know you're the son of God. I know you died on the cross for my sin. I know you rose from the dead. Please come into my heart. Please take over my life. Please forgive my sin and be my Lord and Savior. If you've done that, then you're going to spend all of eternity in perfection in heaven with the Lord. So with that in mind, with that eternal view in mind, why would you want to hold on to some petty little grudge or something? You have a spirit of unforgiveness over something that is, uh, is comparatively insignificant in the grand scheme of things. And remember, as they were, as the Roman soldiers were driving the spikes through Jesus' wrists, what did Jesus say? As they were driving those spikes through his wrists, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so, whatever someone's done to you, is far less egregious than driving spikes through your wrists. And so we need to forgive. And I'm emphasizing that because that's something that I see over and over again as a problem in people's lives. And if you don't forgive and you have an unforgiving spirit, it will hinder your prayer life. Guaranteed, that's what the scripture says. It will hinder your prayer life. And so that's why we need to respond to life circumstances, including its wounds at the hands of others. We need to respond with forgiveness because that's what God calls on us to do. And he doesn't expect us to do it on our own. He knows it's difficult. So he gives us the power of his Holy Spirit to help us to give uh, forgiveness to others through his power. And so the outworking of this kind of agape love includes forgiving again and again and again. And 
we don't, part of that is not publishing others' faults. When someone does something wrong or someone hurts you or injures you or offends you or whatever, you're not supposed to go out and put it on social media. You're supposed to keep it in the smallest possible circle. So if someone offends you, if someone uh, harms you or hurts you or uh, upsets you, you go to that person one-on-one -on -one in love and you say, brother or sister, uh, something that you did uh, really hurt me or something you did offended me and you know we need to talk about it. You don't, you don't get on the phone and say, hey, guess what so-and-so did to me? Or you don't get on Facebook and say, hey, so-and-so did this to me. You keep it in the smallest possible circle. The Bible speaks very, very harshly about gossiping. Gossiping is offensive to the Lord. And so um, you keep it in the circle and forgive the person. Ask for their forgiveness if you've offended them. And then there's an example that's given that we don't talk about very much, but Peter uses as an example of showing uh, uh, this kind of agape love. In verse 9, he says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Offer ha hospitality with uh, to others without grumbling. Now, interestingly, the word hospitality and the word hospital both come from the same Greek root and they mean healing. And when you extend hospitality, you are extending healing because you are showing that person when you invite them into your home, doesn't have to be elaborate, doesn't have to be uh, a five-course meal, um, doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to have your house uh, lickety-split, uh, white glove clean. No, it just means that you're opening your home and you're opening your heart and you're saying to that other person, I care about you. I care about you and I want to help you if I can interact with you and so on. So what, that's why Peter uses hospitality. You might say, well, why did he use that as an example? I can think of other examples of how to show love. And what he's doing is he's saying that uh, hospitality in the Christian sense of just opening your home, opening your heart, is a way of telling a person who might be hurting, who might be lonely, who might be afraid, who might be struggling, you're saying to that person, I care. I want to see you healed. I want to see you well. I want to see you get over this wound. Uh, you see, so what you're doing is you're saying, I care about you and I'm willing to sacrifice to help you. And so that's what hospitality really is. And we should extend it towards everyone and it should be frequent and it should be regular but we perhaps might want to concentrate on looking at someone. Uh, we're coming up on Thanksgiving, for example. Do you know someone that's going to be alone on Thanksgiving? That's a horrible feeling. If you do, invite them over for Thanksgiving dinner. Just an example. But if you know someone who's lonely, someone who's hurting, someone who needs uh, someone to talk to, uh, open your home. Come on over for a cup of coffee and a brownie and, and let's talk. So... Uh, it, Peter gives that as an example. So it shouldn't, and he says, don't do it begrudgingly. He says, do it without grumbling. So in other words, uh, if, if we feel the Lord prompting us to be hospitable to someone, we're just, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. No, you want to do it joyfully because agape love, remember, agape love is sacrificing for the good of the other person regardless of the cost to yourself. And that cost is not just monetary. That's convenience, that's time, whatever. So we need to, uh, as we face life circumstances, one of the ways that our perspective can be more eternal and that always living in view of eternity is we, if we are extending love, real agape, sacrificial love to other people. Well, today we're going to finish up with our third point, which is respond to life circumstances by using your God-given gifts faithfully. We see this again in 1 Peter 4, this time verses 10 and 11. 
1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says this. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So um, we can respond to life circumstances by using the gifts that God has given us faithfully. And there's uh, the giving of gifts for service is something that the Lord talks about repeatedly. He's given us gifts, each one of us who believe in him, who are committed to him. He's given us gifts to help build up the church. That means the body of Christ. The, the worldwide church is comprised of anyone, anywhere uh, who has received Jesus Christ as their Savior, and we are given gifts to help build that up. Um, and so we are each a channel of blessing, if you will. And so we need to look at the gifts that we have, and we need to seek opportunities to use those gifts in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of Christ. As an example, if I have the gift of evangelism, so what I try to do is I seek opportunities to share my faith in Jesus Christ. That's one of the gifts that God has given me. And that's, that's a free gift. That's by his grace. It's nothing I earn. It's nothing I can pat myself on the back for. It's nothing I can strut around pridefully about. No, it's a gracious gift that God has given me that I'm supposed to use. And so we need to be good managers. We need to be good stewards. We need to be good administrators, if you will, of the gifts that God has given us for the good of the whole body. And here again, if we have that alive perspective, always living in view of eternity, and we're seeing the big picture instead of our own little world, and we're seeing eternity, which is endless, Eternity is forever and forever and forever and forever, and that's just the beginning. And why would we be so confined in our temporal, uh, finite lives when we could have a perspective of eternity? And next two weeks, we're going to see some great benefits of having that alive perspective. But if we uh, consciously respond to our life circumstances by using the abilities and gifts God has given us to help others, that will help us gain that perspective. Because we're, looking, we're not looking at ourselves, we're looking at others. And we're looking at the good of the whole body, which is the body of Christ, the, the worldwide church, which lasts forever and forever and forever. So we need to be good administrators, good stewards of the gifts that God has given us. Now, Peter mentions that there are two, there are, he doesn't mention in this passage, but we've talked about this before on Until Ministries, there are approximately 20 spiritual gifts that God has given, uh, and each believer, every believer in Christ has at least one gift, and some have more. But here he divides all those just in a general terms into two types of gifts. He talks about speaking gifts and serving gifts. Speaking gifts and serving gifts. So speaking gifts are imparting God's truth from the scriptures to individuals or groups. And that is the gift from the Holy Spirit that I'm using right now as I'm sharing with you, as I'm teaching you, as I'm preaching to you and to myself first, especially. That's a speaking gift because I'm imparting God's truth from the scriptures, from the scriptures to individuals or to groups. Uh, and then there are serving gifts that he mentions, which are deeds of kindness, where we can help others, help around the church, help others in their lives as we've been speaking. Those are called serving gifts. 
And Peter is saying, whatever gifts you have, speaking gifts, serving gifts, use them in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of Christ for the building up of the bodies, the body of Christ. Be faithful in using those gifts. And as you do that, it will change your perspective. You respond to life circumstances by using your God-given gifts faithfully for the good of others and for the good of Christ's church, that will help you gain that perspective of always living in view of eternity. And so the power of gifts for service comes from God. This is not something you can do in your own strength. It's not something you can do in your own power. The strength and resources and the opportunities are supplied by God. And we have to be sensitive to the spirit of God's leading. He will lead us who to go to, who to minister to, who to help, who to share the gospel with, etc. We have to be sensitive to the spirit's leading. This is not about us. This is about the Lord. He'll provide the strength. He'll provide the resources. He'll provide the opportunities. He'll provide the power and he will provide his precious Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us as to what we're supposed to do. And then notice as we close the, the goal of gifts um, for service, the goal of all the gifts that we use to serve others is to glorify God. It's so that God will get the credit. This is not about us, as I just said. This is about God. We don't, we don't help others to get credit. We help others to glorify God. God is glorified when we do the things that we've been talking about today, using our gifts uh, for the Lord. And he gets, he gets the glory. He gets the credit. And so as we close here, we need to respond to life circumstances by praying earnestly, by responding with deep, deep love, loving one another deeply, and by using our God-given gifts faithfully. When we do those things in our response to life circumstances, it'll help us to develop the perspective of always living in view of eternity.